The NBA Draft Lottery, always a spectacle, always unpredictable, the fate of a franchise rests in these tiny little ping pong balls bouncing around a machine all to see their logo to be drawn. It makes the drama of it all, that is the NBA, even that much more exciting. But while most draft lotteries of the past in which you haven't seen a ton of movement in terms of teams jumping others to get to that top spot, this draft lottery in 2024 saw all kinds of movement and the implications of some of these shifts in the draft lottery are huge that will impact impact more than just one or two teams. So in this video, we're going to be talking about the biggest changes from the draft lottery and what it means for all the respective teams involved. Of course, if you're new to the channel, you like this type of content, it would mean a great deal to me if you subscribe to help the channel grow. And in return, I'll be providing more NBA content like this. Now, it is important to note that this is being viewed by a lot of scouts and analysts around the league as one of the weaker draft classes in recent memory. The draft doesn't project to have a generational type talent on their hands, and the talent is sparse in terms of the level of tiers of talent anyway uh, that you see from mock drafts where prospects are expected to go. They're all over the place. There is no clear consensus number one. In fact, most around the association expect that the number one pick could be between five or six guys. You have some mock drafts projecting a given prospect at the end of the lottery at 13 or 14, while other mock drafts have the same name in the top five. It really is all over the place in terms of assessing the talent of the class and which players are expected to make a true impact at the NBA level. That said though, just like in every draft class that has preceded this one, there are always those gems, diamonds in the rough, whatever metaphor you want to use, that end up exceeding expectations relative to their draft comparison. And I'm sure this class will be no different in producing NBA players that some teams are going to wish they didn't pass on. So while I've heard the narrative that having number one pick actually puts a team in kind of a tight spot to be in because you're likely to draft a bust at number one than you did in years past, or how some are saying that picks one through 10 are more or less gonna be the same, and it's a crapshoot to see who ultimately becomes the best player of the class. But wherever you stand in your belief of this draft class, there were some key things that happened during the lottery selection, and of course, we have to start with the Atlanta Hawks landing the number one overall pick. The Hawks, a team that had a 3% chance of getting the number one pick, somehow lucked their way out into this one, and to be honest, it couldn't come at a better time for a team that is at a bit of a crossroads. You're talking about a team that just two off seasons ago made an all-in move to trade three first round picks to being unprotected to the Spurs for DeJounte Murray. Doing this after finishing ninth in the East and barely getting into the playoffs, getting bounced in the first round, they got Murray and they didn't really get much better. In fact, you could argue they got worse because who knew that two point guards wouldn't fit well together. They see a first round exit last season and then this year, even worse, finishing 10th in the East and getting beaten badly in the play-in to be sent home early. So it's clear their current roster does not work and it's time for that roster to make some swift changes. By getting the number one pick, you now have a host of options and I don't mean a host of options of who they can select with that number one pick, but more so what they can do with that pick. I mean, first off, I talked about this before, but for those saying, well, the Atlanta Hawks should just tear it all down, rebuild, start tanking for picks. They owe their pick in 2025 to the Spurs, and it's unprotected in a draft class that is expected to be a lot deeper than this one. And then they owe their pick as well to the Spurs in 27. So tanking is not an option when it only favors the San Antonio Spurs. But there is a world where it could be done if they try and trade Trey Young to the San Antonio Spurs. Now, first and foremost, I don't like that fit of Wimby and Trey. I've said it before. I think Trey Young is a very overrated player who doesn't impact winning, but I'll leave the Wimby Young fit aside for now because Trey Young has been connected to the Spurs and trade rumors. And if that actually ends up being the case, then the Hawks could conceivably restart and rebuild because the Spurs, after landing the number four and number eight pick in the draft, have the most enticing package to offer the Atlanta Hawks in exchange for Trey Young. But not only that, the Spurs, if they don't want to package their two lottery picks, or maybe the Hawks aren't interested in those picks, they could pivot and give them back their two unprotected first round picks in 2025 and 2027, giving the Hawks control again of their picks and allowing them an opportunity to quote unquote tank, if you will. In this instance, they'd likely trade DeJounte Murray for more draft capital, or maybe they keep him and try to build around Murray while they recoup some of the picks they lost in the Murray trade by trading Trey Young. But either way, it gives the Hawks an out because you could walk away with a situation in which you have three lottery picks from this draft at number one, four, and eight, or you still have your number one pick and you get your picks back in 25 and 27. Speaking of the Spurs though, I don't think people realize just how big it was for them to have both the Nets 
which ended up being a pick for the Rockets, which I'll talk about, and the Hawks jumping in the top four for them. Because the Raptors, that first round pick that they sent them in the Acapurtle trade was top six protective. And by those two teams jumping them into the top four, that enabled them to land the pick at number eight. When I'm sure the Raptors, at the time that they made that Yaka Pirtle trade, they were hoping this was going to be a late first rounder. And the Raptors did everything they could. When they pivoted midway through the season and saw that their roster did not work and they traded OG Ananobi and Pascal Siakam, they really tried to ensure they would keep that pick by losing, what, like 15 games in a row at one point? But it's why sometimes tanking doesn't pay off, as nothing is guaranteed in the draft lottery. Just ask the Detroit Pistons. And so for the Spurs, you're now in a situation where you've got the prize, the pick that you got last year at number one in the generational talent in Victor Wimbanyama. Then you also have two top eight picks in this year's draft, and they now have first round picks coming to them from the Hawks in next year's draft, and potentially the Chicago Bulls as well, as the Bulls owe them a first round pick that is top 10 protected in 2025. The Spurs are in an ideal situation to truly build out this roster for the future around Wemby, whether it's by using the picks to select up and coming players entering the league or packaging the picks in a trade deal to get an established player like a Trey Young, for example. Let's talk about the Houston Rockets, though. They lost their pick to the Thunder at number 12, which was to be expected, but they also had an unprotected pick coming their way from the Brooklyn Nets that was part of the James Harden trade back in the day. Seems like a long time ago, but actually wasn't even that long. But as I've always said before, trading unprotected picks in the NBA is just so risky, especially when it's so far out into the future because you have no idea how the landscape of the league is going to change from season to season. You have no idea if there are going to be major injuries to your roster, and you have no idea if a player that you're trading for isn't going to be a good fit. And in the case of the Nets, after they traded for Harden, I'm sure they likely thought the super team that they had put together was going to be on a path to a dynasty, and those picks wouldn't have much value being late first rounders. But guess what? It didn't work out, and they had to abort that super team experiment. And to make matters worse, they got more unlucky by getting quote unquote lucky and having their pick move up into the number three spot. Good for the Rockets, though, who started making some strides this season with their new look roster now, and they have another lottery pick at their disposal to keep building on that roster. And unfortunately for the Nets, they still owe the Rockets another unprotected pick in 2026 and two pick swaps in 25 and 27, which based on how things are trending and the Rockets on the up and up and the Nets falling below expectations, there's a world where the Rockets are able to exercise their rights to swap to get the better pick between the two. As far as other big takeaways from the draft lottery, I mentioned the Detroit Pistons falling out of the top four and landing at number five. Uh, this is the second straight year in which the Pistons had the worst record in the league and got the number five pick. Literally the worst possible pick they could get at their record, and that's where they ended up. Again, this is why tanking doesn't always work, ladies and gentlemen. It's why the league implemented a lottery system and made the odds of the lottery more flat over time to prevent teams from all out tanking and trying to be bad so they can get a top pick. Nothing is guaranteed. Your odds are better, but it's never guaranteed. And for the Pistons, a team who set a record for the longest losing streak in the NBA, finished the year winning just 14 games, they don't even land in the top four. Don't get me wrong, having the number five pick in the draft isn't terrible, especially when it's a draft class like this one where the difference between the number one pick and the number five pick is negligible, but it's still brutal for this team that has been so bad for the past few seasons and despite the added young talent, cannot get out of the bottom of the East. For the most part though, those were the biggest takeaways from the draft lottery. You also had the Hornets and the Blazers fall out of the top four where they were expected to land, which is unfortunate for them given their teams that are trying to build for the future. That said though, for the Blazers, they ended up getting a lottery pick from the Warriors where I'm sure the Warriors at the time they made that trade were hoping this would be a late first rounder. So the Blazers get the number seven pick and number 14 pick in this year's draft. But it's going to be interesting to see the implications of all of these picks and the movement of said picks this offseason with an unpredictable draft class. Will the Grizzlies try and trade their number nine pick now that they're expected to get Jaw back healthy and will try to get back to winning again? Will the Bulls look to trade their number 11 pick because they refuse to go in another direction and will try to look and remain competitive despite its roster hitting its ceiling? Maybe the Thunder will try and trade their number 12 pick depending on how the rest of this postseason shakes out for them. It's going to be a fun summer. I suspect there's going to be a lot of movement throughout the NBA, and it's going to be fun to cover along the way. So be sure to subscribe, and I will see you in the next one.